Welcome to this session on boosting foreign direct investment. My name is Courtney Fingar and I'm editor in chief of Investment Monitor. So this topic is something that I've been watching very closely throughout this really difficult for those in the industry you know, trying to attract investment, but also governments who rely upon foreign investment and also for the investors, the companies themselves, and pretty much all parts of the chain here. So we're going to try to unpack that a little bit and talk about some of the challenges that this decline in FDI has created, especially for developing countries, because there are major developmental implications in, in having a collapse of, of this size and scale in FDI. But we'll also try to inject a little bit of optimism and look, look for some patches of recovery and see where this recovery might come from. We have a really great spread uh, of geographies and different types of places um, and perspectives represented here. So let me introduce to you our speakers. They are Robert Herman, CEO of Germany Trade and Invest, Cherry Nursalem, Vice Chair of the Jitty Group, which is a diversified group working in real estate development, manufacturing, and consumer lifestyle. And she's joining us from Indonesia. We have Stephen Phillips, Director General of Invest Hong Kong. We have Carmen Gisela Vergara, Executive Director of Pro Panama, which is an investment promotion agency of the country of Panama. And we have Paul E. Burroughs, Vice President of the Jingsu Industrial Technology Research Institute in China. Welcome to all of you, and thank you for taking the time to join us in whichever time zone and whatever time we find you in. I'd like to just go around because we, we do have a mix of of geographies represented here and just have you tell us how, how things look from where you sit, both in terms of your role and where you're based and what's been the impact on, on your locations or where appropriate your businesses of the COVID-19 crisis and the FDI decline. And, and if we can start with, with Cherry, because you are not on so much on the investment promoter side, like some of your colleagues here, but rather working in business and industry. So what has it meant for your business? Uh, thank you, uh, Connie, and uh, it's an honor to be here with the illustrious panelists. Uh, uh, actually, I have also been uh, supporting the government of Indonesia on investment side. So I think uh, we, uh, I think the COVID nineteen has led to really, I think, a reduction in uh, FDI, as you know. Uh, uh, but for Asia, uh, I think uh, it has been relatively smaller. Uh, I think Yuntech estimate that uh, for FDI uh, to Asia has been uh, about 4% lower in the 2020. And of course, uh, you know, China has been uh, sort of the biggest recipient of the FDI in 2020 and $163 billion in inflows, uh, which has been an increase from uh, 2019. For uh, Indonesia, uh, we have uh, also a very uh, uh, government has taken uh, uh, aggressive policies and introducing omnibus law to attract investments and uh, they have also uh, started to invest more in uh, value creation so supporting uh, uh, I think the president Jokowi has uh, announced uh, that you know we want to support uh, human capital capacity building. And so I think that strategy has uh, also brought in uh, investment. So it has been relatively, uh, kept, it has been kept relatively intact in terms of the foreign uh, direct investments. And in terms of our business, uh, I think uh, uh, we are diversified. Uh, I think the, the aspects on the retail real estate is, is quite uh, uh, hard. Uh, there's quite high impact, especially you know, in for a country like Indonesia, where we we are also uh, uh, had to have some lockdown situation. Uh, but I think the uh, 
you know, some areas would be already open later, um, uh, second half of this year for green zone like Bali. So I think there, there's good progress. Thank you. Let, let's hope so. And indeed, the, the UN's World Investment Report um, has said that Asia has performed better than other places in the world, as you said, in terms of FDI with much smaller declines. And developing countries in Asia have kind of outperformed other regions of the world during this time of crisis. Um, this may be a good time to move on to Stephen, of course, um, Hong Kong there kind of you know, the, the crisis obviously started um, in, in Asia, but that means you're, you're further along the trail, I guess, of, of recovery at this point. And I guess Hong Kong was coming at a, uh, the crisis, coming at a complicated time anyway, with some sort of po- a little bit of political turmoil going there. So how have you found things and what's the current state of, of FDI in Hong Kong? Sure. Obviously, the challenges that we face in terms of um, very little international travel um, are similar to elsewhere. In 2020, we achieved about 63 percent of what we would normally expect in a good year. Um, So, uh, as you say, probably a little bit better um, than global average. Um, you're right that Hong Kong has faced um, not only the COVID challenges, but we had a period of social unrest and um, some of the geopolitical tensions. What, what I would say from a business point of view is that COVID is by far the most significant issue. Um, the social unrest caused concern, um, but that is um, gone and passed. Um, the geopolitical issues... Um, do linger, but not the biggest concern that we hear from companies. I think generally looking at Asia, obviously China recovering fastest, Asia, um, ADB is projecting 6.8% GDP growth um, across the region. I think the pace of innovation, whether it's in China, here in Hong Kong, other parts of the region, also another big driver. Um, Commitments to net zero, Um, China by 2060, here in Hong Kong 2050, I think will also be quite a big driver going forward. Um, Closer to home in Hong Kong, the development of the region called the Greater Bay Area, um, which is the two special administrative regions of Hong Kong and Macau, and nine key cities in Guangdong province, um, I think is attracting a lot of interest from around the world. And in particular, in terms of um, the trade and investment flows with the rest of ASEAN. Um, Beyond that, the Belt and Road Initiative, which I think many people have seen as primarily infrastructure driven. Um, I think one of the impacts of COVID is the digital Belt and Road is a much closer reality um, than many people foresee. Um, so those are just a few of the things that I would observe at the big picture level here. Great. And something that I think we'll want to return to is the, the net zero, because this is is going to be a, a huge focus going forward, but also presents a lot of investment opportunities, as you mentioned. But let's stay um, in the neighborhood, as it were, and, and check in with Paul. So, Paul, you are uh, Paul is a, a scientist, um, but uh, so not not our usual panelist for an FDI um, discussion, although we probably should have more scientists in our FDI discussions. But you are in charge of overseas cooperation, as I understand it. Um, so what are what are you seeing? Um, how is the recovery in Jingsu and, and what's the interest in investment like there? Uh, thank you, Courtney. Um, yeah, Paul used to be a scientist. Now he's just a manager. It turns out if you travel around the world for long enough, somebody decides to put you in charge of overseas cooperation. Uh, so I'm, I'm a little bit falling between the gaps here. Um, Jiangsu province, as it's pronounced uh, in China, let me geolocate you a little bit. Uh, Jiangsu province lies to the north and west of Shanghai. And physically, it's one of the smallest provinces in China. Um, so we're only 80 million people, around about the size of a major uh, European uh, country, which is small by Chinese standards. Nanjing is a relatively small city at eight and a half million people. 
but although geographically small, Jiangsu punches way above its weight economically. We have the number one GDP per capita in China, and we're also the number one location for foreign direct investment in China. And both of those things come, from, uh, I believe, from its, its long status as the manufacturing heart of China, which goes back thousands of years, in fact, to the start of the Silk Road days. And one end of the Silk Road was actually here, and a silk was a major industry from Jiangsu. And, of course, that's since been expanded into high-performance materials, uh, robotics, and a lot of different high-tech areas. And this is why Jitri exists, by the way, the, the Jiangsu Industrial Technology Research Institute, because Jiangsu realizes that to maintain that manufacturing lead, it has to upgrade its industry. And so Jitri is in the process of uh, really acting as an experimental test bed for new ways to get research into industrial production and to upgrade from the old uh, labor-intensive industries and capital-intensive industries to an innovation-driven economy here in Jiangsu. And we're looking at various uh, novel experimental ways to do that. Uh, in terms of foreign direct investment, I kind of blinked when I, when I saw your numbers of such a big decrease and said, um, surely that can't be right. So I pulled the numbers uh, from Jiangsu province itself. And actually in 2020, uh, Jiangsu remains the number one province in China. We had 23.5 billion U.S. dollars equivalent of foreign direct investment, and that was actually a 3.2% increase from 2019. And in January, February this year, the very latest numbers just in those two months show 5.7 billion coming in, which is a 25% increase. So China is definitely moving in, in the right direction and leading the recovery. And I think it's interesting to compare, uh, if you like, China and the U.S. Um, as an American living in China, it's uh, uh, often that I, I get to do this. And it almost seems like they're moving in different directions. If you look at the foreign investment law in China, which came into law in 2020, uh, it actually moves towards greater transparency for foreign companies coming into China and a more even playing field for foreign investments in China. And I'd like to compare that with the situation in the USA, which is to some extent moving in the opposite direction, um, more to isolationism, more to implementations of CFIUS, the, uh, the um, restriction on foreign investment, which has been in some cases uh, implemented retroactively and in, and in some cases for uh, rather perhaps questionable reasons. And I think if you look at those two directions, that really tells you in broad terms why foreign direct investment is up here. And one reason why it should be down in the U.S., although I would add, actually, that when I looked at the numbers over the last uh, 10, 15 years, foreign direct investment numbers always seem to be a little bit lumpy. And you can even look at, uh, I believe it was 2013, when the first two quarters in the U.S., it dropped about 20 percent um, as we were coming out of the Great Recession. So these numbers tend to go up and down, and uh, you should look at the long-term perspective, I think, before panicking too much. Yeah, that, that's right. And, you know, broad FDI flows can be more volatile. It's usually the where you see the, the I guess, the flatter trends tend to be in greenfield investment because those are the long-term. Those are the projects that need to take a, a long view. Um, and as, as you mentioned, so there have been a, a slight cooling effect um, for, I guess, the openness to Chinese investment, um, not just in the U.S., but but Europe as well. And I think this is something we'll probably need to return to in our conversation um, because of Chinese investment being such a major driver of global FDI flows. Um, so with mention of Europe, let's turn to Robert. Now, Germany obviously is, is a major investment destination, but also a major source of, of outbound investment and major trade partner for, for many developing countries. Um, how are things looking in Germany and, and how is your role at this current moment in time? Yeah. Um, thank you, Kurt, for the um, introduction as well as for the opportunity to, uh, to discuss together with you all um, uh, about that topic. Um, uh, I have to also, um, uh, I'm a, Germany is, um, uh, kind of in between of what Paul mentioned and what is happening in Hong Kong. So we have a, um, uh, until the, uh, as far as I see the latest numbers, I will have a decrease in the investments into, um, Germany of about 17%. So it's not that high as, um, uh, the average of 40%. 
um, uh, I think there's an overlay of different aspects that uh, uh, yeah drives the investment scene. So um, we have seen Corona or COVID pandemic. Um, uh, we see um, the different uh, say paces uh, of uh, coming out of the crisis. Um, China is uh, playing a tremendous role for German industry um, uh, in terms of trade development as well as investment and development. Uh, China is a, a major investor into Germany, um, uh, even though not the last, uh, la um, largest investor into Germany. So the highest numbers we got last year from the United States. Um, uh, the second year in a row before we always had China. Um, so American companies tend to Having also um, a different way of invest investments uh, within Europe. Um, so we have a lot of um, uh, British companies investing into, uh, uh, let's say, mainland Europe um, uh, and, and then there also in Germany. So that's the next overlay. Then we have um, uh, um, a kind of a um, speed up in uh, digitalization through Corona. So we end automation. So that, that drives um, the development of different industries and um, that brings us to the larger projects that we had um, right before the corona pandemic as well as within the current pandemic um, uh, we have large projects into germany in the automotive scene um, that we never have seen before um, in the last let's say uh, 15 to 20 years so we had tesla investing into germany uh, we have huge battery manufacturings um, battery plants um, uh, coming from Asia, from China, as well as from Korea um, with investment uh, projects into Germany last year in the midst of the pandemic. Uh, so published in November, uh, one of the larger Chinese battery manufacturers decided to invest into Germany. So um, uh, there's an overlay of, of different aspects uh, that comes uh, to us and um, also that drives what is happening next, uh, what's coming up, because um, all that Come, brings together a different speed in digitalization and automation. Um, and the um, topic of sustainability um, has kind of disappeared a little bit in Europe because of the pandemic. Um, but uh, below all these um, activities, um, it's still there. And I see the government's fostering um, uh, programs um, or put, setting up programs to um, uh, to develop um, investments into that topic, sustainability. Um, uh, that will drive um, the next steps of investments um, into Europe. Um, I would say into Europe, but probably also everywhere in the world. Thank you. Yeah. So what what we're seeing here are some some bright spots, you know, underneath the big ugly global FDI figures. Yeah. Um, not all not all gloom and doom here. Uh, Carmen, to, let's move on to get a Latin America perspective here. But Panama been, um, you know, in recent years, an investment destination getting a lot of attention. Um, I know you were promoting actively for nearshoring operations. You also, of course, have a lot of logistics activity. Um, how is it looking for you there now? And are you optimistic about a, a recovery? Uh, well, thank you. Thank you, Courtney. And uh, thank you for the invitation to participate in this panel. I I want to start by saying that, as you know, Latin America and the Caribbean has been severely hit by the crisis. Uh, I mean, we have 8% uh, of the world's population and we are responsible or have had a third of the deaths that have been reported uh, throughout the pandemic. So that it's uh, because of many structural problems that we share in different types of uh, of ways in our countries because not all countries in Latin America are the same. And uh, the health crisis has been accompanied by an economic downturn of, I mean, historic proportions. Nobody was prepared for anything like this. And, you know, this following several years of very disappointing growth for some of these countries. So, it's no wonder that all of the international entities that are now forecasting their recovery process for the countries 
uh, in Latin America have said that economies like Brazil, Mexico, Mexico and Argentina will take longer to recover and we'll, we'll see recovery processes towards 2023 to 2025 Whereas Panama and other countries like Colombia, Costa Rica, Peru, or Chile, who had been growing before the pandemic and had a better economic development, will start seeing uh, the recovery of investments and exports by uh, the end of this year, 2021, and and going uh, forward in the next in the next few years. So. Yes, we are optimistic in that sense, but of course, you know, building economic, social, and environmental resilience, it's like the center for us of the recovery uh, process from this crisis. Because to us, there is no sustainability or sustainable development without resilience, and there is no resilience without sustainable development. So they go hand by hand or hand in hand. And in our country, as you know, and you just mentioned, we have a logistic platform that is on parallel in the region because we have the canal and then the ports around the canal and the railroad and the airport, which guarantee connectivity through sea and air like no other country in, in the region. And for concepts like nearshoring, as you said, Uh, Panama is uniquely positioned to offer itself uh, to countries in the world that want to build back better uh, this this platform to do so for the markets of Latin America and the Caribbean. So, yes, it is it is uh, looking good for us. But Panama, as as the rest of the world economy, uh, we understand the the need to generate the success decisive action to rebuild our economy after the, the COVID pandemic. And to do so, we are not only looking to revise our, you know, medium and long-term goals, but instead we are looking to introduce fresh thinking about the ways those ambitions and aspirations can set in motion a, a multi-stakeholder uh, change process. So, Yes, uh, the short answer is that, yes, we're optimistic, but we are also cautious of all of the things that need to be done in order to make through those pro uh, provisions or predictions that Panama is among the countries that is going to recover better, faster, because there are still so many things that have to be done internally in order to do that. Yeah, indeed, and you know every country will have its unique challenges. But the what you what you say about resilience and sustainable development fitting hand in hand is a is a challenge faced by by many countries around the world. Not an easy one to tackle. Um, and part of the building back better, which you mentioned, is around um, sustainability from from a, a um, environmental perspective and. And the net zero. While we've got Cherry here, Cherry will have to leave and leave us a bit early, unfortunately. Um, but the, but the reason that that she has to leave us is to have a very important meeting, as she's just been uh, received a very important appointment with the Indonesian government. Um, Cherry, can you tell us about that? And 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 following that, what opportunities do you see from the net zero imperative? Um, how can that help also spur economic recovery? Uh, thank you, Courtney. Yeah, sorry, I, I have been uh, uh, nominated and uh, as the special advisor on uh, climate and also blended finance uh, for the government, and I. Uh, we have to have ministerial meeting preparing also for the Biden April summit, so climate summit, yeah. So I would like to um, uh, mention that actually there has been a, a major opportunity because of the stimulus packages that have been pumped in about 3.7 trillion directly um, into sectors that uh could have opportunities of lasting impact for carbon emissions and nature, including agriculture, industry, waste, energy, transportation, and others. And uh, there is this greenness uh, of stimulus index that have looked at these stimulus packages for G20 countries. But unfortunately, I think we have not harnessed that. So 16 of the G20 countries actually have failed 
to uh, tie the stimulus to opportunities on green. I think the EU has been an exception. I think many of the countries have actually done that. So the packages could include um, corporate bailouts with green strings attached or investment in nature-based solutions, such as Indonesia is going to launch a green bond uh, or nature bond. And, and I think there are opportunities for sustainable agricultures or loans and grants for green investment, subsidies, of course, tax reductions and other, uh, including R&D. Uh, I, I think one thing that uh, is an uh, op opportunity for us to look at, and Indonesia uh, will be the host for G20 next year in Bali. Uh, I think we have launched the first uh, blended uh, the largest blended finance event in 2018 is called the Trihita Karana Forum uh, for Sustainable Development. And it, I think we aligned, uh, at that time, World Bank IMF annual meeting was in Bali, and we aligned global partners, uh, including OECD, uh, International Chambers, uh, uh, UNSDSM, CDB, many uh, uh, international partners uh, have joined in to uh, create a roadmap uh, on blended finance because I think that the idea of blended finance is to uh, bring in government uh, as well or, or philanthropic funds to incentivize the private sector uh, to put their funds into areas that solve uh, sustainable development goals and of course uh, COP, I mean the uh, green aspects is a major part of, of that. And we uh, we have uh, uh, successfully uh, mobilized at that time $10 billion um, to support pro different projects, especially the Indonesian government launched the uh, SDG Indonesia Fund. This is under our able uh, lady minister, Sri Mulyani. And also at that time, there's a SMI, also led by uh, Emma, who is... Uh, very capable leader. So this blended uh, infrastructure fund will go look into green uh, green investments. And uh, I think the principles have uh, already been sort of worked on and uh, we are looking by next year also to, to move further on that. And I think we, we welcome the world uh, to, to support Indonesia as we uh, try to solve our complex issues. I think we are still, you know, quite far from the uh, achieving um, uh, the targets, but the governments are very dedicated and cross ministries are working hard. So today's meeting that I have to excuse myself, hopefully we will have sort of formalized the task forces that include envisioning a net zero. Thank you. Great. Well, we look forward to following what that, those initiatives might look like. And we will, we will uh, thank you for your time and we'll let you go to, to carry on that, those important conversations. Thank you. Um, and following from that, obviously the, you know, the, the, the difficulties of the COVID crisis, the economic, um, recession and the FDI collapse is, is going to harm developing countries, uh, quite badly. And the SDG goals were already you know, way off target and are now expected to be set back even further. Um, how can we find some balance? What can be done and, and what kind of role can FDI play in that? And I want to ask Paul about this because I know, Paul, you're involved in, a, in another organization uh, for which this is a bit close to your work. Yeah, in terms of um, uh, developing countries, uh, 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 recovering in, in FDI. Uh, part of my job um, at JITRI is to serve as head of the China office of the secretariat for a UN-derived organization called WATRO, the World Association of Industrial and Technological Research Organizations. Um, we run the secretariat in partnership, actually, with the Fraunhofer Institute uh, in Germany. Um, WATRO was spun out of UNIDO in 1970. UNIDO itself was only created in 66 with the mission to help developing countries basically upgrade their industry and link industrial research to industrial production. And the unique thing about WATRO for me is I, I think why UNIDO very quickly realized that they had to create it because a lot of these United Nations agencies are organized on the basis of country. And as we all know very well, countries very often find reasons to disagree. 
may not necessarily be even in their own best interest, never mind anyone else's. And so uh, working on the country level tends to end in gridlock because Waitro is actually organized at the organization level. Its members are research and technology organizations in different countries, not the countries themselves. And my experience is that when you go to research organizations themselves, you don't find people who are looking for problems. You find people who are looking for solutions to problems, and they just want to work together to solve those problems. So Waitro just celebrated its 50th anniversary, and its mission is to uh, bring organizations together across national boundaries to work specifically towards the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And we have a number of different products. You can go to waitro.org and, uh, and see what Waitro is doing uh, to actively help that. We're also partnering with organizations like the Research Fairness Initiative um, to in ensure that when developing countries look at foreign direct investment, they get a good deal, right? Because um, I, I think developing countries have seen a lot in the past that foreign investment comes in, uh, basically invests in the natural resources, and, and when it's over, developing country is left with a big hole in the ground and all the profits repatriated back to the original country. So the, the question is how to get these um, organizations in more developing countries, research organizations, uh, a, a equal seat at the table. And that's the beauty of Waitro, that we have members in Indonesia, we have members in, uh, in uh, Malaysia, a lot of members across Africa. I think we're up to close to 100 members of Waitro right now. And those organizations can actually sit at the table and discuss investment ideas and cross-border collaboration with organizations like Jitri, like Fraunhofer, like the big European uh, powerhouses, uh, DTI in Denmark, uh, Leitat in Spain are, are all members. Um, so Waitro there, I think, can be a significant contributor to helping developing countries uh, generate more investment, but doing it on equitable terms where they actually get something out of it uh, and, and it profits both parties uh, in the transaction. Thank you. And, and Stephen, I'm curious from the perspective of um, not just Invest Hong Kong, but looking around the region, how, how large does sustainability SDG goals and ESG criteria factor into your strategies? Do you, is, it, is it prominent in the way that uh, the development paradigm is being assessed in the region? Um, I think it'd be fair to say that certainly in Hong Kong and probably Asia more broadly, um, that overall on sustainability, SDGs, ESGs, we're probably lagging Europe and um, some other parts of the world. However, I think in the last year or two, it really has come to the fore in terms of being an issue. Certainly we see in Hong Kong, ESG being of great interest across all the sectors that we're working on. We're doing more and more work around SDGs. Um, our Department of Justice is embedding it um, in their work. So we're sort of rapidly going up the curve is um, my impression. Thank you. And Carmen, I wanted to come back to the reshoring because I know that's very important to your strategy in, in Panama. And there's a lot of discussion of the big, great reshoring trend that has been accelerated by COVID. Um, but other people feel that this this might be over overblown. So I'd like to ask you if if you think there will be a large scale um, nearshoring of activities and do you think that places like Panama can benefit from that? Um, and then I, I would like to ask Robert about that as well, purely from the perspective of, of German companies, which again are major, are major investors around the world. Yes, well, that's an excellent question because as you said, it's an ongoing the discussion because, um, well, we're, 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 we think that this is a, a way to move forward from the pandemic, but of course the market will determine. Now, I have to go with, uh, with the data that we have and that we analyze. And just recently, according to uh, a survey by Deloitte, 
83% of companies are diversifying production to meet new customer demands. It's, it's up 28% from before uh, the COVID crisis. So we think that as part of these efforts, you know, organizations are rapidly adapting their own operations to respond to the shocks. And countries like Hundred ports all over the world through 144 maritime routes. So you don't find that kind of connectivity everywhere in Latin America. And then we have the, the hub of the Americas at, at our Tocumen International Airport that also moves people from uh, all over the continent uh, to all over the continent. And this facilitates cargo and people movement from Panama. But then if you put that together with the the digital uh, infrastructure that we have a virtual information highway here with seven well soon to be eight uh, fiber optic cables now adding the Curie cable that Google is building which is also going to go through Panama I mean that that gives us a, a unique position to help companies in their recovery process that are looking to sell to markets in Latin America and the Caribbean. And then we also complement that with the market access through 21 free trade agreements that we have that give access to products and services with special treatments to 55 countries and 100 and, and 1.3 billion consumers around the world. So we think that, yes, that, that countries like ours can benefit from these new tendencies. But, of course, we have to do the work and we have to make sure that we offer not only the infrastructure, but also the, the good business climate, the, the trade policy, the, the laws that are favorable to investors, but clear rules of the game. And these are the things that companies completely and over and over again keep telling us that they are looking for. They are not looking for you know, tax handouts or uh, that those kinds of, of investments uh, or, or incentives. They are looking for clear, clear rules of the game. And this is what we're looking to, to do now in Panama, you know, so they can make their investment decisions uh, with political and economic stability, a predictable legal framework, and a good regulatory environment. And, of course, well, it would be too long to go into into the the trade capacity building here, but that is also another area that we're working very hard on because we think that human resources and the skills that they will need to attract these investments that are going to come as a result of the pandemic, mostly based in new technologies mm -hmm. or new uses for already existing technologies, you need to have your workforce prepared so that they can reap the benefits of what is going to come with the recovery process. Absolutely. And, and Robert, from the perspective of German industry, or do you anticipate um, any big changes in the way that the German companies, for example, consolidate or set up their operations around the world? And, and if I can throw a second question in there, how can governments of country, developed countries that are major sources of FDI better support and incentivize outbound investment that might help developing countries that need that investment? Do you feel that that is an appropriate, you know, metric to, to judge countries by? Hmm. Um, I think the topic of reshoring or nearshoring is uh, very interesting. Um, and it's something that is, has been discussed from the very first months last year. Um, uh, at least in Germany, um, where we had, um, discussions about, um, is that now, is now the time to bring back investments into Germany, um, with regards to the uncertainty in value chains? Um, interesting enough, it's, um, a discussion of politicians and governments. It's not a discussion of companies. Um, so, um, I would say the, uh, 
the industries, the different sectors are even doing the, the opposite. Um, so they are driven to make sure that they have um, a clear, secured value chain um, on the global market. And in, let's say um, the genes of um, German industries um, is um, trade, international trade um, and international um, uh, structures and in international markets. Um, so um, for the companies in Germany, it's more important to even even more globalize um, uh, than before because um, they have recognized during the um, crisis that there are markets or if there would be a market that is closed down or shut down for any reason, um, they are too much dependent on these mm -hmm. value chain topics. So they um, are um, more, even more diversifying their um, suppliers base um, and um, uh, uh, global um, footprint. On the other hand, um, and I think this is a very imp important topic um, because, and that, uh, that we haven't um, uh, touched yet, but um, we have um, more and more competing systems globally. We have China, we have um, maybe also Russia. Latest trends in India is um, also similar to China um, to be um, in the more and more independent on other markets and companies from other des destinations. Um, America has discussions um, how to pro support their um, uh, industry through Buy America uh, topics or um, legal frameworks um, and Europe is um, uh, probably also or has um, also developed some um, legal, legal um, aspects on that topic. Um, that might drive, on the other hand, um, reshoring somehow because the governments are more and more driving regulation towards um, having sustainable structures for the future. How can we ensure that we have a sustainable industry for future technologies within Europe, um, and for example? And uh, is, does that mean that we have to have a protective structure or support system um, for European companies and the other way around for China and other destinations? Um, that might drive, um, uh, again, the other way around companies to reshore somehow in their um, or countries of origin um, and to benefit from government structures that are um, established through, for example, the uh, stimulus packages for uh, during the corona crisis. So I think there are um, uh, very interesting developments um, that we will see. And then uh, we have, uh, addition to that, the automation as the aspect of automation um, and um, digitalization, so you can do, um, do or manufacture products more and more um, easily in uh, high cost countries, um, with uh, even though that might be um, a la before might have been before a labor intensive manufacturing place or um, product. Um, so that will drive also directions. Um, very interesting to see. But from a company's perspective, I would um, say the companies more seek to diversify, um, seek other markets um, and make sure that they have their footprint on an international, really, really global um, um, uh, market opportunities. Thank you. And I think this is where the challenge comes for a lot of developing countries is that the, the cost cost factor becomes less important the more there is automation. There isn't that cost arbitrage anymore, which means that the other factors have to be in place and the skills have to be there further to Carmen's point. So that is the big challenge. Um, we're coming to up to the end of our session, which has gone very quickly because there are a lot of topics that I wish we could still um, yet to to get into. We didn't really touch much on the U.S., um, despite this being um, a U.S. forum, but I hope what we've added to as we've come near the end of the of this uh, program for this um, U.S. event is to give a flavor of what's going on elsewhere in the world and how some of these dynamics will ultimately impact the U.S. relationship um, with its trade and investment partners. So I would like to thank you all very much for taking um, the time to join us and share your insights. I wish we could um, chat a little bit more, but I'm sure we'll have future occasion to do that. Special prize to Robert for waking up in the middle of the night um, to to Same for you. For me, uh, <laughs> to do that. But I'm very glad that that we were able able to gather. Thank you very much um, for the organizers for letting us um, uh, join the program, and thanks, of course, to the audience for tuning in. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Courtney, for the organization. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.